Oh, everybody got a seat? Well, let's use the stair anyway. Um, <laughs> great, Daniel. Have you seen this room this packed before? I haven't. It's awesome. This is really nice. Um, well, thinking fast and slow with uh, Daniel Bryant. Go take it away. Thank you very much. Um, Welcome everyone, thanks for coming along after lunch. This is traditionally quite a hard session because everyone's full of chicken and pasta and various things. That can be quite tricky to concentrate, but I'll do my best to make it entertaining. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about thinking fast and slow, particularly in the context of software development. And this came from a book, the book's called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, I stumbled across it a couple of years ago, um, really enjoyed it, and it talks about heuristics we use to make decisions and the biases we might have as, as, a human, as human beings. As I was reading it, not only was I enjoying it just you know, as a general read, but I couldn't help thinking a lot of this stuff relates to what I do in my day-to-day -day job as a software developer or architect. Um, so what I'm going to do today is try and relate some of my insights from the book and some of my techniques I use to get over some of these biases and some of these problems we might have with deci um, making decisions. So we're going to look fundamentally, as, as you go through, think about this. Our decision making can be flawed. Doesn't matter how clever you are, how, you know, everyone like all of us as software developers like to think we're clever, but there's fundamental biases we as human beings have. You need to apply processor models to overcome some of these biases. And the key thing is about applying the scientific method in some degree, this build, measure, learn philosophy to what you do, to continue iterating and getting better at every, every step. Agile software development in a nutshell, but at different levels. Another key thing is you need to collaborate more and better. And we'll look a bit more how you can do that as well as we go through. Just very briefly, I like to put this slide up to boost my ego, um, but also to um, mention to you like, uh, some of the things I do. I love learning, I love teaching as well. That's really what I want to put this slide up about. But I also work as a consultant, so the stuff I'm talking about today, I've done in the real world. Um, so I've been bitten several times by things I've done wrong, things I've done right. So I want to share some of my learnings and some of my mistakes with you in the hope that that helps you as well. Um, so, workplace decision making. I, I don't know, hopefully many of you have heard of, of Dilbert, it's kind of an international phenomenon I think. But um, Dilbert often talks about um, a lot of great stuff that I see in the workplace. And one is about making decisions. Now I'm sure a lot of us as software developers like to think that we're immune to this kind of thing. You know, the management, our pointy haired boss, might come up with crazy ideas and we can clearly see how those decisions are flawed. But I think we as developers and architects have the same problems sometimes. Before we can look too much into that, we're going to have to cover um, sort of the fundamental model of how we think. Um, and the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, uses two models. There's System 1 and System 2. Now, System 1 is fast, instinctive, emotional, the subconscious brain. I've often heard it called the chimp mind or the reptilian brain. And in a sort of biological sense, it's typically the limbic um, system, the limbic brain, close to your brain stem. System two is the slower, more deliberate sort of thinking. It's the bit you identify as you. The neocortex, typically we look at it in the biological um, means. And it's the bit where you, you, know, you engage to do reasoning, to do um, thinking. So I want to do a little bit of experiment, because it is after lunch, I want to warm you up a little bit. There won't be too much participation, but a little bit should be, a little bit be very much appreciated. I'm going to show you two calculations, and I want you to try and work them out. They'll be in quick, succe quick succession. Uh, um, as you're working them out, watch what you're doing in your thought process as well. Okay, so two calculations. First one, second one. Okay, they both have the same answer, but I bet when you saw two plus two straight away, like that, system one cuts in. You know, we use it so much, we're taught from a very young age, two plus two, four, very small numbers. It's, it's instinctive, your system one cuts in, you jump straight to it. Now, system two had to cut in. Did you notice there was a slight bit of effort? And again, as all smart people in the room, developers, architects, and so forth, that's not a massive challenge, but there was some effort engaged there. Yeah? You had to go, oh, hang on. Uh, on a biological level, your blood pressure might have gone up slightly, your pupils might, have, pupils might have dilated a little bit as well. You have to engage in effort. And this, oh, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll put in another slide, which I was going to do as well, yeah. So, um, you often see system one and two uh, in the context of optical illusions as well. So if you look up there, you can see two faces, similar size, or you might see a vase. And now I've mentioned both things. Your system one probably showed you one thing. Your system two will now allow you to see both of those things. So one more experiment I was going to do here, and actually another one as well. But I don't know if you've seen this before, but I'm going to give you three options. I'm going to say who thinks the top line is bigger? Who thinks the bottom line is bigger, or who thinks they're the same? So quick show of hands if that's okay. Who thinks the top line is bigger? 
about 5% or so. Who thinks the bottom line is bigger? Who thinks they're both the same? So that's most of the audience, but I've actually tricked you. The top line <laughs> is bigger. The classic system one, yeah. So not only have you seen this before, most of you probably, but I also primed you a little bit by mentioning about the faces being the same size as well. So it's very easy to trick. You know, I'm not saying you should have got how you measure and measure this stuff, but be wary, particularly of people presenting about this kind of stuff. Um, well, a final experiment is, um, I'm just going to read this actually, so I'll read it over here. So, Bob is a single male in his 20s, bright, quiet, like science fiction and fantasy, and avoids interacting with people in the real world. Um, what do you think is more probable? Is Bob a programmer or a programmer and plays massive online games? Quick show of hands, who thinks it's more likely that Bob is a programmer? It's about sort of 5%, 10%. Who thinks it's more likely that Bob is a programmer and plays online games? About double, I say, than that. But think of this is actually what's called the conjunctive fallacy. If you think about, um, if we think about it for a moment, in terms of probability, programmers and online games players, if you've got the and in there, it's clearly more probable that Bob is going to be a programmer than a programmer and plays games. Yeah? This happens quite a lot. James had a great talk in here just a minute ago, actually, about probability and so forth. But this, this is something that comes up that although we know it exists, we don't always apply it in our day to day lives. So, system one. It's rapid, it's associative, it has systemic errors. It, kind of, um, it came as the time when um, we were being chased by dinosaurs, the evolutionary sense that the brain was developing. Um, we were being chased by dinosaurs, tigers, that kind of thing. And a false positive wasn't a big deal. If you thought you saw a tiger's face, you're running. No problems, yeah? Um, that's fine back in the day, it was a great survival mechanism. But the problem is, we see tigers' faces everywhere these days. And in the kind of work that we do as developers and architects, false positives aren't always a good thing. System two is lazy. We have to kick it into gear. Hopefully, you saw that with that calculation. Two plus two, no problems. The other, the other calculation, you had to kind of go, oh, let me think. You have to kick system two into gear. And it's causal and it's not statistical. You've probably heard people、um, talk quite a bit about liking stories. You know, we've transmitted knowledge through the ages using stories as opposed to stats. You know, when we talk about like,、um, Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, you, you know it's a great story behind it. You don't know that 0.5% of all beans are not magic, that kind of thing.、Yeah? We think about stories rather than stats. So, there's a number of biases the book talks about, a number of heuristics in the way that we think. And I'm going to talk through some of them that affect software developers、um, and see what you think as we go along, OK? So, the first, the availability heuristic. If something can be recalled, it must be important. You see this a lot in the news.、Um, you know, whatever's being talked about, you think it's important. Obviously, very sad times now with some of the terrorism things that go on. But because It sells newspapers and it generates interesting news. It's kind of this virtuous or, or vicious loop, if you like, in that whatever is recalled is important. People think you know, there's more likelihood of them being affected by a terrorist attack than there is by, say, being hit by a bus. But in reality, that's not the case. But whatever can be recalled easily is thought to be important. And we've suffered from this quite a bit as developers and architects. And I call this hipsteritis. I hope this translates in, in Swedish, but、um, we say hipsters, people that are on the latest kind of things.、Um, and for example, if I was to say to you now, what do you think is the best architectural style at the moment?、Uh, if I was to give you a greenfield project, what would you use to build it? Microservices, lovely. Yeah, and I make a lot of money off microservices, so I can't really complain too much, but I'm just as guilty for reinforcing some of these things. But yeah, totally. Everyone loves microservices. Frameworks, products, emerging.、Um, it's a vicious circle, virtuous circle, whichever you want to look at it.、Uh, this kind of it's available, therefore, you know,、um, we, we talk about it even more. I don't know, has anyone seen the MongoDB as web scale video? It's a hilarious video, actually. It's, it's, actually,、um, it's a transcript,、um, and they made a fun video of it at a conference where someone was talking about the benefits of MySQL a few years back when NoSQL was kind of getting really popular.、Um, and then、uh, this guy at the end of the presentation stood up and asked about you know, why he's.、Um, Why you spent MySQL? Mongo kicks ass, basically. And I've put some of it up, you can have a quick read now, but it's worth going to that site and having a look at the whole transcript. The guy's using highly available things. The person asking the questions going, yeah, Mongo's web scale, it's got shards, it's got all these available words, and he doesn't actually know what they mean. And it leads to a hilarious、um, conversation where he talks about, you know, I'd rather get kick ass benchmarks and worry about durability. And the retort is, well, if you're, worried about, if you're not worried about durability, I suggest you pipe your data to dev null. It's very fast and it's web scale. Which I thought was a brilliant quote, yeah? You've really got to think. Just because something's available, it's cool, shards, microservices, look a little deeper. That's, that's the kind of thing. It's all about engaging system two. Rather than just reacting to what you're hearing, what you think is cool, what your peers are necessarily telling you is cool, you have to stop and engage system two. And I think you do that really effectively by spiking and prototyping, experimenting, evaluating, that kind of thing. 
but it all starts from a foundation of constant learning. Yeah. So find trusted mentors, and they're all around you. We've got like probably a couple hundred in this room potentially. Yeah.、Um, they're your peers. They're your people you might see. You know, is below you in the management chain. People above you. They're all around you. Read the classics. Learn about the foundations of software development and, and what you do. And cultivate blogs to stay up to date. I've got a whole list in Feedly actually that I regularly read, just so I'm aware of all the latest things. So as a consultant, I often walk into companies, and what they think is their problem is not their problem. But I've got to know about things. Like, I walk in now, and they go, "We want to use Docker. We want to use Mesos." I'm like, "Awesome technologies." But why? I've got to know about the technologies before I can sort of ask the right questions. You need to build a firm foundation of、um, current information, but also the, the classics. And obviously, we're at a Java conference, so in terms of the classics here, I'm going to shout out Richard and Raoul's book as well.、Uh, these, in my mind, are the classic Java books. I've spent time over my 15 odd years as a software developer reading these as they've been brought in. Um, a really good example, actually, a client site recently. We were testing some、um, concurrency, uh, uh, and then everyone was straight away was like, "Oh, we、we'll、use Acker. Yeah, we'll fire up Acker because you know Acker's got quite a bit of buzz about it, and it is a cool framework." But few, some people in the team were like, "Hang on, this problem, Acker's going to you know make it complicated. We're going to have to learn Acker as a team to use it. We can actually just use countdown latches and phases." And to be honest, even I was like, "Phases?" I had to look in the Java currency book. I've forgotten about phases, but they're really useful for phasing sequences of concurrent events.、Um, so it's reading the classics as well as building on your knowledge all the time. Really useful. I want to now give you a quote about sort of talking about evaluation. And the quote is, "I will postpone using this shiny new framework until my peers have validated the proposed benefits with rigorous scientific experiments." Said no programmer ever. <laughs> I think we're all, we're all like, we all like relate to that, yeah. We, but imagine we like to think of ourselves as professionals, but in this day and age, imagine legal people or medical people doing the same kind of thing.、It'd、be craziness, wouldn't it? Absolute craziness. But we're kind of you know we yeah for whatever reason we're not quite there in this maturity of our our profession yet. I think we should work towards it. Bob Martin, Uncle Bob, talks a lot about this stuff. Actually, if we're not careful, we're going to be regulated fairly soon. We need to get more professional. We are regulated, I suppose, to some degree, but not as much as it could be. I found this technique really useful. Actually, Richard and Martin introduced it to me back a, a few years ago. It's based on a blog post by Matt Rabel where he's comparing web frameworks, and he's got his web frameworks at the top there on the x-axis, on the y, got criteria. Now, and, and I find this really useful. You not only do you use this sort of as an individual, but you can use it as a team and compare results. And it, it removes a little bit of the subjectivity. Obviously, a lot of these things are still subjective evaluations, but in a group, it gets a bit better. Um, and also, one really cool thing is you've got a record of why you've made decisions. All too often, as a consultant, I, I turn, in, uh, turn up at a company and I say, "Why are you using Rails? Why are you using Play?" And the honest answer most time is, "Don't know." A few companies I walk into, they've got sort of justification. Some of it is, you know, the vendor sold it to us. Not ideal, but at least there is a justification.、Um, but some companies are doing this, and it's something I introduce as a consultant quite a lot. It's great in terms of actually applying some process to evaluating things, but it gives you a record you can take away. And over time, as people move on the project and so forth, you've always got this as, as kind of living documentation. So, second bias now. Optimistic bias, and it's people tend to be overconfident, believing that they have substantial control in their lives. And I'm going to spin this a little bit in that. It's often I know what customers want. How could I possibly be wrong? Rule number one as a as a consultant is you are not the user. You are not the customer. Constantly I have to I have to stop myself thinking I know what's best. I have to ask a lot of questions. Over the last few years as a consultant, I've got really good at asking the right questions. When I started, I, I didn't. I used to come in and go, yeah, you know, solution, 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 vet framework. Even though I'm not affiliated with any particular framework or technology, I always saw solutions rather than looked for the right problems. So, four factors that are,、um, of optimistic bias. I might have to look at my notes here because I often get some of these switched up. But、um, the first one is desired end state and self-enhancement. We like to think about good consequences, good ending things. When we're visualising the thing we're building, we put an optimistic spin on it because that feels good. We want, you know, when we're talking to people, we want to share that kind of thing as well.、Uh, and we think we have a lot more. Control than we actually do, the perceived control. And Stephen Covey talked about this actually in I think it was the Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And you have、um, I think it is a sphere of sphere of control, which is pretty much yourself. You have a or maybe it's a sorry, circle of 
Circle, okay. circle of control, a sphere of influence, and then the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is huge, yeah? And you think you can control all those things, but in reality, all you can control is yourself. You're all in a small circle. You can work hard to influence the next level, but then out of that, there's just nothing you can do about that thing. You know, I won't throw on, on mic, but bad stuff happens, as they say, yeah? Um, and uh, cognitive mechanisms is an interesting one. So when we're um, evaluating and comparing things, we tend to think in stereotypes. It's kind of how we work as humans. We, we block things together. And that's great sometimes, but not always. And you have to be selective at when you apply these kind of things. And the, the singular target focus is, again, just focusing down on one thing where it would be more appropriate to look at the bigger picture. In my mind, a lot of things I do is looking at the correct levels of abstraction, be it in code, be it in architecture, be it in... Um, tests, be it even in the actual requirements themselves. There's the micro and the macro, sorry, there's the macro even, and the micro, and there's a meso in the middle here. You have to look at it, things at the right level of abstraction. And the hardest part of a lot of analysis is choosing the right level of abstraction. But it's knowing that that's a problem, is one step in the right direction. A lot of us just kind of jump without always being conscious of what we're doing. Information about self versus target. So we know ourselves intimately well obvious statement, but we often apply what we think we know to others, or we have difficulty applying um, what we think we know to others. Not everyone thinks the same, and again, as a consultant, I've actually learned over my time that the best team is a highly diverse team. And I'm talking in terms of um, sex, skill, everything, you know, um, specialities. I used to think, you know, a team full of really good programmers, like so just, just the Java was amazing, but now I've come to realize you need some people that perhaps are really good at database stuff, that are really good at modern requirements. Diversity is amazing but it's hard to reason about that sometimes. So surround yourself with interesting people uh, and they'll hopefully sort of rub off some ideas onto you. And be very careful about overall mood. I've worked in quite a few startups and the worst possible time you can start predicting what your customers want is after you've got funding. You're all happy, well, I know what I'm doing, yeah, <laughs> all that kind of thing. And then you start making decisions that are biased because you're happy. And then it goes vice versa. If you're very negative, you can often actually influence decisions when, you know, when, when you're actually um, in a bad mood as well. But be conscious of your mood. I think as developers, we sometimes, I'm speaking for myself actually, you must be careful what I say, but yeah, speaking for myself, I tend to close down sometimes. I tend to block out emotions and, you know, and try and, I'm highly logical, try and focus on things. But that's not always appropriate. Sometimes you have to listen to your actual you know, instincts. And again, it's all about knowing that appropriate level of abstraction. Should I listen to my gut or should I apply process and you know, uh, have some justification of what I'm doing here? The key thing is defining clear goals in terms of thinking what customers, you know, thinking you know what customers want. And then once you've got sort of the, the why, there's a great um, book and YouTube video actually by Simon Sinek, start with why. It's a really key thing, and often I do a lot of that in organizations I, I go into. I start um, by saying, what do you actually want? Why are we here? What, you know, what, not what the problems are, what solutions are, why are we actually here? Define clear goals and then iterate from there. Build, measure, learn. Remove uncertainty early, and Dan North's done some amazing talks in general, but this one in particular about patterns of effective delivery is really worth a watch. He talks about things like the um, dancing skeleton and the ginger cake and various patterns um, about how to kind of remove uncertainty or at least limit uncertainty early on in a project's life cycle. Because if you think about it, when you start a project, your actual knowledge is kind of, you know, very limited. As the project goes on, you're developing code, you're chatting to users, your, your, um, your knowledge goes up. Um, often we're forced to make decisions down when we know the least, but um, Dan's got some great techniques for, for getting around that kind of thing. Software is inherently collaborative as well. I think we forget that sometimes. I've really got into pair programming over the last few years. Um, before I was a bit you know, hesitant, I, I, and I still like to do my own thing now, to be honest, as well. But I really see the benefit of pairing, particularly in certain um, sort of circumstances where we're iterating or where I don't know the domain that well, that kind of thing, or, or where I'm training up people or where people are training me. Pairing is really useful. Um, so I'm going to recommend a few more books. I appreciate there's a lot of books coming at you. I will slay, um, share the slide deck afterwards as well. Um, but Impact Mapping is an amazing book for figuring out what impact you actually want to make as a person or as a business. Superb little book by um, Goiko. And he's got some great presentations online that's well worth looking at as well. If you're looking about making an impact in a business, business model generation is really good. It's a very lightweight way of defining what you as a business want to achieve. Uh, and I've been using that actually with a couple of businesses we're looking at starting up now, and it's, it's really, really good. Uh, it's not too heavyweight. It's not like your big fat you know, business plan or whatever, which takes like a, a year to do and then you never get funding. This is real lightweight stuff, really good. 
And the Lean Startup, obviously a classic, and Jez, I think Jez is at the conference actually, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of his talks, but Jez has produced a book, it's only just out actually, and it's kind of a, it's almost the enterprise version of the Lean Startup, and it talks about applying the scientific method to requirement generations, to building, to DevOps, to everything in the enterprise. It's a really good book. I'm only about sort of three, th three quarters even of the way um, through, but it's gold. All the references in the book as I'm reading other ones that I've been reading over the last few years, and I'm like, oh, it's just all tying this stuff together really nicely about validating what you're going to build. Uh, I'm a big fan of XP, Extreme Programming. This is the classic book. Still, I think it was written, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago now or something. It's still a classic and still very much worth a read. And then about getting in um, touch with sort of um, your mind and how you interact with others, I'm a big fan of Edward de Bono's stuff. He's got the, the Six Thinking Hats and a few other books as well, and they're really quite digestible but very powerful books about the importance of um, communication, how you interact with others. Uh, things like Crucial, Crucial Conversations is also a very good book, particularly if you're working with clients a lot. I have to do um, some, quite a few Crucial Conversations, uh, and that book has been really helpful to me as well. One, uh, one note, I don't know, has anyone heard of the Hippo? Does anyone know what I'm, what I'm talking about, Hippo stuff? Um, it's basically the highest paid person's opinion. Yeah, and I go into uh, organisations a lot, and I'll be careful what I say now, obviously, I'm being recorded, but um, and people uh, think, like the, the highest paid person thinks they know what's best. You know, A-B testing, whatever, that kind of thing. Uh, and sometimes yeah, that is appropriate. Look at Steve Jobs' success. You know, he said if you'd ask what the customer wanted, they wouldn't have come up with iPod, that kind of thing. But when you're iterating or trying to validate a business model or even code, A-B testing is really valuable. Look at um, your likes of AWS, Spotify, Netflix, Etsy. They're all really good at this kind of thing. So don't always default to the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. Try and get the A-B testing things, you know, uh, applying some sort of rigorous, uh, some logic and some rigorous uh, testing around what we think we actually want is what we actually uh, should be developing. So the next thing is the, um, the planning fallacy. And this one states that there's a phenomenon in which predictions about how much time will be needed to complete a future task display an optimistic bias. I think this is quite an obvious one. When, when was the last time you completed a project on time? I know many of the places I rock into. When I, usually when I'm called as a consultant, it's not going right, so I very rarely see um, projects that are on time, but that's just the nature of my job. Um, and on budget? Yeah, you'll be lucky. <laughs> the thing is, like... IT has got a bad rap, but perhaps for a good reason. Uh, there's a few stories here. Sainsbury's had uh, to can a supply chain management system. It was like you know, $500 million. And NHS um, patient record system, they're pretty much canning. I think it's called Lorenzo. It was meant to be like a national um, project they're rolling out, and now it's going to be more regional. And it's already cost $10 billion taxpayers' money. M my money. <laughs> Not good. Uh, Healthcare.gov. I'm sure you um, saw you know, across the pond uh, interesting stuff going on around that, the kind of fiasco that was around that. We've not got a good reputation, but again, we should really learn from this. We should take this as, you know, a, as, a, as a hint that we need to improve our processes as an industry. And the most common factors of failure, I've just chucked load up there. I got this from the IEEE publication. It's, it's a good read, actually, and quite um, eye-opening. Three things I think are directly uh, influence, that we could, de sorry, we could directly influence as developers or architects. And really, the crux of all these things, and in particular these um, things, are bad decisions, bad justification, bad communication, that kind of stuff. Um, it's stuff we just keep glossing over, thinking the latest framework or the latest architectural paradigm will solve our problems. But it clearly won't, in my opinion. So, one thing you can do is this notion of segmentation. Uh, the book talks about this quite a lot, divide and conquer, and we're seeing it now with the, sort of the rise in prevalence again of SOA, microservices, and Simon Brown talks a lot in architecture about modules and componentization. Not new concepts by any means, but they're actually finally taking hold now in the industry. You've got to think not only at the micro level, though, you've got to think at the macro level as well. And this comes into systems thinking. There's some great books I'll recommend in a minute. But you've got to always flick at the right levels of abstraction. Um, again, Amazon are really good at this in terms of like, breaking out teams. They've got their two pizza teams, which are teams that could be um, fed by two pizzas. So like, no more than, say, six or 12 people. Um, breaking problems down at all levels, breaking it down at the project management, at the discovery phase, at the testing phase, at the implementation phase, uh, and then ultimately the, you know, a bit of Conway's law in action, very popular law around microservices. But you develop software that's bounded, within a bounded context, say, in terms of DDD. Um, and this, is, I find, is really valuable. And it allows you to model the business much more accurately than trying to do one model to rule them all, that kind of thing, which you do see, I see quite a lot, actually. 
Um, you've got to remember the integration costs. That's where the system thinking comes in. Uh, you've got to understand your systems. A uh, very popular thing in, that Jez talks about in his book is value stream uh, mapping, which is a really, va really valuable technique I've used as well. Um, you can, you know, it's surprising. Organizations assume something's a bottleneck. When you go in and do an analysis, actually the thing that they think is a bottleneck is not. There's lots of you know, waiting time here, or there's queues for work here, or there's validation needed here. Actually going through and putting it down on paper, value stream mapping, is a really valuable um, exercise. And it allows you to understand the system. So if you poke something in here, something pops out here, you'll understand the relationships better. Really valuable concept that, again, Adrian Cockroft from Netflix, or Battery now, Battery Ventures, talks a lot about this, and with good reason, in my opinion. Oops, I've jumped, sorry. Um, and um, another thing is, is this whole build, measure, learn again, but in the plan, do, check, act. I think that was from Deming, Peter. Um, I might even be Deming or Drucker. It's one of the classics. But again, it's that sort of scientific method. It's applying some iteration, some learning to what you're doing. And also, try to improve estimation techniques. As things get a bit smaller, I find it's easier generally to estimate. Then you also need to add on the kind of the integration costs on top as well. And just on that note, this is a great book. Not necessarily an easy read by Mike Cohn, but it's a great book around how to improve estimation and planning in an agile fashion. Um, taking a step back a minute, I find user story mapping, new book, but really good at understanding the actual problems I'm trying to solve. They have this notion of a backbone of what you're trying to develop, and then the minimum viable product essentially at the top. Um, and just the way you develop stories is so critical in terms of communication and design, both at sort of a smaller level, DDD, Bounded context, ubiquitous language, all this good stuff. You know, it's, quite, it's a classic book now, it's you know, a few years old, but it's a really good read in understanding how to model the business appropriately. And at an architecture level, I definitely recommend anything by Simon Brown. Um, codingthearchitecture.com is a great website. Um, I know Simon talks at a lot of conferences. If you ever get to see him, please do. He's, he's really worth chatting to. Um, and not only um, do you want to make sure the, kind of, you know, the modeling and the architecture level, you need to understand the business understands. What you're, sorry, you need to help the business understand what you're developing. I'm a huge fan of BDD techniques. John Smart, I've met him several times, great guy um, from Australia. And he's written this book now, which is a real gold mine of information. It talks about techniques like the three amigos. And um, whenever you do requirements gathering, always have a business stakeholder, a developer, and a QA. Bring the QA forward. You know, typically, QA can be gatekeepers, checking quality, that kind of thing. But bring them forward. They've got a lot of great business knowledge. Add them into the mix when you're trying to sort of um, come up with requirements. And then ultimately, with BDD, you end up with an executable, speci spec yeah. executable specification. That's not really the, the massively important part. It's often the investigation you do as that is kind of the process is more important than the actual output sometimes. But often you do end up with a specification that like cucumber, that kind of thing, that you can execute as a regression test. But yeah, there's three amigos. This notion of collaborating appropriately and at the right time, the beginning of the project is really valuable. I mentioned about systems thinking. This is the introductory book um, by Donna, Donella Meadows. Really good book. Um, it's probably more advanced than the other ones, but I found it really good at understanding. When Adrian Cockroft was talking about it a lot, I suddenly thought, yeah, I should pay attention to this because he's a smart guy and he often sees the bigger picture. And particularly as I do more architectural type roles, I'm trying to learn more about that as well. And, and this is definitely helping me on my journey as an architect or you know, that, that kind of role. So one thing I would say is you have to accept some things are going to be unknown. As the joke here is deal bit, it's like, you know, it's logically impossible to schedule for the unknown. Think more like a manager. Yeah? We'll, we'll fix problems before we find them. But yeah, as developers, I think we often like to think everything's in our control. We like to think we're logical, um, but stuff isn't. I've seen all too many projects that have succeeded or failed because of unknown unknowns. So just accept that, I think, is, is my advice there. The next um, thing we're going to look at is the sunk cost fallacy. And this states that any um, past cost that has already been paid and cannot be recovered should not figure into the current or future decision-making process. The key thing is, when did you last remove a framework or a library from your code? Yeah, I know I'm very reluctant to do this, you know, and I've got better over the years, but it's, you know, once you've sunk the cost in, we don't like being wrong, do we? I don't think anyone, let alone programmers or architects, we just don't like being wrong as people. Um, and the thing is, there's this thing called the endowment effect, and that when you own something, you ascribe even more value to it. So if you create some software, even if you can logically think, oh, if I remove that bit of code, it's going to you know, make things much faster, you're often reluctant to, because you own that bit of code, even if it's collective ownership. Once you own something, you ascribe more value to it. So you have to take a step back every so often and go, hang on, I know I own this, but... Is this really the right thing? Should I change things? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And there's a big thing about loss aversion. And I think the book and I think some other studies claim that loss、uh, to humans, loss is twice as powerful psychologically as gain. And I think this is quite accurate. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you think about it, say like、um, you were to walk out of the building here, open your wallet, and yeah, hundred pounds or a thousand、um, krona suddenly disappear out your wallet. Think for a minute what that'd be like. Open your wallet. Whew, that money gone, lost. Yeah. And now think if I was to go, go, come up to one of you after the session and go, here, here's a hundred pounds or a thousand krona. Still good, yeah. Don't get me wrong. But think about the two things: opening your wallet, whew, losing that money, or me giving you that money. Think about which is more impactful. I do think loss aversion is a really key thing. We are reluctant to to let things go. So my sort of take on on how we might get over some of this is to retrospect regularly.、Um, Think: Did we make the right choice as a team, as an individual? Be very honest. Yeah, my current, the current、um, client I'm working with is really good at this. They do proper retrospectives every week, post-it notes. What have we done good? What have we done bad?、Um, what can we, you know, keep doing? This kind of thing.、Um, a lot of companies I go into, they they pay it lip service. They don't actually do retrospectives, or they just go around the room and everyone goes, yeah, good, yeah, that's right,、yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Not good. You really got to invest into it. That's the only way you, as a team, can grow. Really key. And you got to figure out.、Um, Mary Poppins、um, talks about this, but the last responsible moment. And it's kind of the way I visualise it. Is imagine like you've got a、um, project and there's you know there's a fork ahead in the road. Where at that moment you've got to make a decision. And if you don't make a decision, it's implicit what you're going to do. It's almost like the default decision has been made for you. This last responsible moment is really powerful, but something I really struggle with. Um, you know, I often look like, oh, that's what. You, it's very easy to look back and go, I should have made the decision there, but I didn't. But retrospecting on this kind of stuff is really valuable. I definitely recommend you do it. Be honest as well. That's the only way you're going to learn to grow、uh, effectively.、Um, So yeah, how, so、um, what can we learn? Again, this book actually,、um, the Agile Retrospectives, is really good in terms of、um, learning what we've done、um, bad, what we've done good, this kind of thing. Really, some really good techniques and games you can play.、Um, and how can we get better? Again, lots of great techniques. Sorry, guys, someone talking on the phone. That's quite distracting. Cheers. Thank you.、Um, Uh, yeah, anchoring bias. Finally,、um, so this is the common tendency to rely too heavily on the first piece of information offered when making decisions. Yeah, you see this all around in, in the media. But、um, I'm going to give you, a, I think, an example most of you can relate to is how does your manager ask for estimations? Yeah, is it an unbiased question? You've got a piece of work, an application that you know is going to take four weeks worth、uh, of development time. He pretty much knows it as well. How do you think he's going to ask you? I think it's something like this. Application to be ready in two weeks. Yeah, that would be great. I think that's what he's going to do. The problem is he's anchored you now on the two weeks, so it's really hard for you to say it's actually going to be four. So you're probably more likely now going to say it's going to be three. You know, you know, you've got a bit of leeway, but you can't push it to four. This anchoring technique is really powerful. And my advice as a developer architect is to sneak in and do this to your manager before you, he can do it to you. <laughs> that's really good, but that's not that's not official advice. But you know, I find that quite useful. <laughs> um, the um, The key thing is, is learn to say no in a professional manner. Provide explanations,、uh, alternatives. It's part of, I think, our, our growth as、um, as we mature, you know, and become、uh, sort of senior developers or senior architects. This kind of thing. You, you have, like Bob Martin talks about this a lot in his Clean Coder book. Actually, you have to learn how to say no. It's actually more professional to say no and give alternatives and explanations than to say yes and take it on and you know hunker down, working、uh, all through the night, that kind of thing. It is people will respect you more. I've, Honestly, I've seen this in my career.、Um, when I start saying no to people and, and giving justifications and saying, "Look, I'm, you know, my team is maxed out," you actually get more respect by the person asking, and that's a virtuous feedback,、uh, sort of virtuous cycle that they then won't ask you, but they know they can dump stuff on another team. For example, not great, but at least your team's good. <laughs> so,、um, but it's, it's a really key thing: learn to say no professionally. Make sure user stories are well defined.、And、it's all about collaboration again. A couple of books I mentioned before: user story mapping, that kind of thing,、um, and the Three Amigos again is really powerful. Cannot emphasise enough、um, how much success I've had. And small, you know, small thing, but using the Three Amigos can change a whole business. When people, it, often it's weird when you go in and say, "Look, you know, QA、uh, stakeholder and dev are going to get in the same room." People were like, "What?" You know, like the, the PMs might be like, "I don't talk to developers. You know, I don't talk to the QA," which sounds nuts, but it's all too common. But you know, you're all in it. You're all building the same project,、uh, same、uh, application, same software.、Um, it makes sense to collaborate early in the journey when you know you know the least about the actual product you're building. 
Great technique by, um, or introduced to me by Uncle Bob, uh, was the PERT estimations. It's basically the three point estimations. So you do, um, you estimate the project, how long I think it's going to take, and then the worst case and the best case. And using stuff that James mentioned in his previous talk, you can do some kind of probability distribution um, stuff with that, and it's really beneficial to get a more accurate view of how long the project might take. Excuse me, rather than just going on one number, which is all too easy to do, isn't it? Oh, I think it will take four weeks. Well, what's the deviation there? Is that one four weeks bang on, or is it four weeks? Could be two, might be eight if we hit a roadblock, or is it one where you've got no idea? And then you bound it, you know, massively. That thing I think I find really valuable. It takes a bit of time, and PMs and managers are often reluctant initially to invest time to do this kind of stuff. But then the irony is that they complain when things go off schedule later on. So work really hard to get these kind of techniques in early. And there is some mathematical backing to these techniques. So I find that's kind of a good sell to managerial type people um, sometimes as well. So. I've got read your way to tech lead, but obviously you can't just read your way to tech lead. You, a lot of other things you've got to do, you've got to learn, you've got a lot of experience, this kind of thing. But these are books that have helped me on my journey to kind of more of a leadership type position within software development. Uh, Peopleware, classic book in terms of um, how you know, tech people work and so forth. Um, Laws of Leadership, I'm a big fan of John Maxwell actually. He's a, he's a pastor in the States, but he's written some amazing books um, and I, I highly recommend them. They're very kind of to the point of, of what he's talking about. I've mentioned Bob Martin. <clears throat> Anything about Martin, in my opinion, is, is usually quite um, interesting. Even if I don't always agree with it, I find it quite interesting. Quite, you know, sort of, I like to pull some of the bits he talks about apart, but great inspiration. And Sandro from London, Sandro Mancuso. That book actually now is published, I think, on another, um, another company, I'm not sure. But it's a really good read. It's more story-based than The Clean Coder, but a similar kind of concepts. It talks about his journey as a, as a craftsman, as a code craftsman, as a professional, and it's really worth a read. Um, and if you come out to London and Sandro's doing a meetup, please do come along, because he's a top guy, uh, and you know, he'd love to have a beer with you and, and chat about what he's up to and stuff. You'll learn a lot. I know I certainly um, have done. Um, Jürgen, I met Jürgen actually at Geekon, I think, last year, Jürgen Apello. Got some great books. He's got a new um, workbook actually based on this. It's about management, but not in the kind of what I would consider the boring type of management. This is more about um, how you manage your teams and how you upwards manage, downwards manage, all this kind of good stuff. And it's very modern, it's very agile, it's very based on um, scientific principles as well. It's a chunky old read, but it's really good. I think by this point you're probably guessing that I've got a long commute, which I truly have. I commute one half way, one and a half hours each way to work, so I do read a stack load of books on the commute. I appreciate it's difficult for some people to do that, but um, I definitely recommend um, reading as much as you can. So let's wrap some of these things up. I've given you sort of um, a few hints at the heuristics and biases we may use or suffer from as humans in our day-to-day -day role as software developers and architects. Um, the reason I've recommended a lot of books, other than my long commute, is I really like this quote. You'll be the same person in five years as you are today, except for the people you meet and the books you read. It's by Char Charlie Tremendous Jones. He's a motivational speaker over in the States. Um, and obviously, it's a bit nuanced. It's probably more to life than just that. But I really like it. As a professional, I want to grow. And part of my passion is learning and teaching. Um, so I realize the people I meet and the books I read are so influential in what I'm currently thinking and what I'm currently doing. I think by being at JFocus, you've already said, you're committed to meeting interesting people. You know, by coming to a conference, you, you've already kind of put yourself above what, if you, you know, could say, put yourself above a lot of developers by saying, yes, I want to learn, I want to see interesting sessions, meet interesting people, this kind of stuff. But it's really important, I think, to augment that kind of learning with book learning as well, if you've got the time, if you can carve out time. And I think often we're so tempted to read about microservices, Spring Boot, Docker, this kind of stuff. But I say stretch yourself. You know, a lot of what we do is based on good thinking, on communication, and whether you like it or not, software development and architecture is really based around understanding a problem and giving a good solution. Yeah? And the key thing here is I find that the Thinking Fast and Slow is a really good book to get me thinking about the biases and heuristics that I use and I'm kind of subject to in my day-to-day -day work. And then this book, Pragmatic Thinking and Learning by Andy Hunt, fantastic book. I've got a mind map actually here that he's got in the beginning of the book. Uh, this is not me, as I say, this is Andy's book. And it's really good about um, how to leverage the best out of your mind, how to overcome some of the, the biases you may be subject to. And it talks about sort of using the Dreyfus model to understand how you learn so you can teach the next person. Um, it's about <clears throat> debugging your mind, there's some really cool things about left brain, right brain. I find that really useful, actually, in terms of being like, one of the brains is um, more sort of creative and more associated with language, the other's more logical. That was kind of cool to learn about as well. And some great techniques about learning deliberately. Again, I find I've, I've used these quite a lot over the years around now, I, when I read a book, I read it with purpose. You know, I, I do read 
um, fiction books as well, just for fun. But when I'm reading a tech book and I want to get something from it, I do apply a more systematic approach to actually learning. And this book was a really good um, pointer in the right direction for this stuff. So, in summary, then, um, we are all prone to bias. You know, even if people are, the classic often in companies is, I know my own bias. Obviously, you don't, because it's a bias, yeah? But you like to think you do. But apply models, apply processes to overcome some of these things. Particularly as a group, these things are really valuable, and they help you engage system two and provide documented evidence of, that you've done that as well. You need to learn, do, retrospect, and repeat. Build, measure, learn, plan, do, check, act. They're all the same fundamental things. It's iterative, it's kind of the scientific method applied in other contexts as well. And if you can teach, I've got into this more over the last couple of years, both in, in London and conference circuit and so forth, and I find it really valuable. Teaching helps me put sort of my ideas together and also get some great feedback from, from yourselves as well. You know, I didn't like this, I didn't understand this, and it just helps me so much uh, as an individual, and then I can hopefully share that on with other people. And on that note, do collaborate more. I think, you know, I think we're seeing a turn in our industry with pairing and all these kind of things. Uh, and even the leaders like Netflix and Amazon, they're sort of veering more towards this um, smaller pods, you know, groups of cross-functional cross people um, collaborating effectively across the business as well. But in my opinion, like, when I've gone into companies, I, this, when this is working well, you can really see the difference. When you go into some shops and you know, developers sat at their workstation, typing away, there's no communication, you can usually tell what the code base is going to look like, and you can tell some of the, how the, the processes that they're going to be using and will look just by the fact of walking in the office and seeing how, how the company's working. Bottom line, it's think more deliberately. Again, as software developers and architects and in this kind of role, we like to think we are logical and we like to think we think correctly, but I certainly don't. And the book was a real eye-opener in that respect. And hopefully some of the um, things I've talked about today will get you thinking the same. Think more about how you think. On that note, thank you very much. <laughs> now, I have got time for a few questions if anyone um, does, or you can come up and chat to me afterwards. I'm around the conference for the next couple of days as well. I mean, if anyone's got any instant questions they want to share, Richard? Hi. Yeah, so the question, great question, Richard. So the question is there, I've talked about a lot of the negatives of System 1. Is there positives with System 1? And it is a great question, actually. It's something perhaps I want to think about um, a bit more in terms of putting it into the talk. But yeah, definitely, sometimes um, the gut feel is really important. Um, you know, that we've got emotions and, and these kind of things. And often we tend to override them, but they are actually um, pointers in the right direction sometimes. And learning to harness that is, is really tricky. Um, but most definitely, yeah, it's easier to point at the, the negative ones, I think, um, sometimes. You know, that's probably why I'm doing it. But no, it's a really good point. Some, and again, it comes with experience. That, that book's actually the Pragmatic Thinking and Learning. It's got some great techniques about how to sort of retrospect and evaluate your own experience, how to learn through experience. Because I've definitely made loads of mistakes, you know, in, in, over the time of my career. But I like to think I don't make too many of the same mistakes twice. You know, I try and improve every time. Um, and part of that is knowing when to use system one and when not to. Sometimes when you go in, something just doesn't feel right, you know, or system one kind of cuts in straight away and you jump something, it's at least worth paying attention to that. That's, I think that's one of the key things I'm trying to say is don't override system one. System one is fantastic. You know, it makes you jump out of the way of cars and that kind of thing, you know, which is really important um, when you're on the road. But um, the, the key thing is take the opportunity to, to engage system two. Don't just go, boom, yeah, I know you know, my, I should be doing this or I should be using this framework. Think, why are you making that kind of decision? Does that help, Richard? Yeah. Cool. Anything else at all? Cool. On that note, then, I'll say thanks again. Thanks. Cool.